why does the NFL have a personal conduct policy? Why does the NFL care about the things that football players do away from the football field, away from the football facility, away from the team? Seven months of an offseason, on your own time, living your life. You get in trouble with the law. There's a resolution of that situation. No jail time, probation, whatever the case may be. Most other employers would look the other way. It's not our business. The only thing that matters to us is are you able to show up and work? And if it gets to a point where you can't show up and work because you're incarcerated, then we have to deal with this employment issue. Now, look, some employers will blur that line, and there are instances where you need to blur that line. If you're a bus driver and you had a DUI, probably something that will affect your ability to continue to drive a bus. But for most employers, you have an incident away from work. It doesn't affect your ability to show up and work. It's none of the employer's business. It's between the employee and the criminal justice system. The NFL decided as a matter of PR. They decided it was good for business to care about and actively police the things that players do away from work. And that is something that had been lingering and lingering. And in 2007, thanks to Pac-Man Jones and the late Chris Henry, the NFL ramped up the punishment specifically for guys who have multiple incidents. Even if they're never arrested, even if they're never charged, even if they've never spent a day in jail, multiple incidents will get you in trouble more quickly than a scattered accusation, allegation, or confrontation somewhere out in public. So that was the way things worked from 2007 until 2014. Then came Ray Rice. And what happened with Ray Rice? The NFL initially suspended him two games based upon the information that was available to the NFL, including a video that we all saw of Ray Rice's then fiance knocked out cold on the floor of an elevator as Ray Rice was standing there apparently trying to figure out what to do next. Now, after that two-game suspension was announced, there was some blowback. There was some harsh criticism of the commissioner for only suspending Ray Rice for two games. Then came the video that the NFL either did or didn't have or either knew or should have known what was on that video. I mean, we knew she was knocked out. Somehow she got knocked out. And then we see the video of the punch that knocked her out, and the NFL essentially ends Ray Rice's career. And that was the moment because the commissioner's career was almost ended in the aftermath of the emergence of that video. Remember, it was the day after the start of the 2014 season. All hell broke loose. And, and the NFL should have been doing a victory lap after a great week one of action. Instead, the NFL was reeling. For a couple of weeks, the commissioner had to worry that his time as the man in charge of the sport was over. And I think at that moment, he decided that he'll never be accused again of going too softly on a player who was accused of doing something away from work, especially when it involves any type of domestic violence. We saw the personal conduct policy get beefed up. There was the Adrian Peterson situation, the Greg Hardy situation. And as of 2014, the NFL was ready to pounce on any player accused of any type of misconduct, especially involving family members, wives, girlfriends, children, etc. So fast forward to 2017. That was when the NFL decided to throw the book at Ezekiel Elliott based upon what I believe was flimsy evidence and a poor procedure not aimed at giving Ezekiel Elliott a fair shot at, at defending himself. The NFL was determined to suspend him for six games. Again, the commissioner was never going to be accused of going too softly on a player who got into trouble off the field. So six games, period, that's it. Well, what happened in 2017 was two things. First of all, the TV ratings continued to plummet after 2016 when the ratings first dropped due to the presidential election. On top of that, in the aftermath of the Ezekiel suspension, what happened? Cowboys owner Jerry Jones went after the commissioner. Remember all of that? Commissioner was negotiating a new contract. Jerry Jones was trying to get that derailed. Jerry Jones wanted to get rid of the commissioner. And so the pendulum now, which had swung very sharply in favor of overpunishing players, now it starts moving in the other direction. And I think it was a combination of the assault by Jerry Jones on the commissioner and the idea that the TV ratings are down. What do we do to increase and enhance the TV ratings? Well, one of the things you do is you make sure the best players in the NFL are available to play. Ezekiel Elliott was gone from the team that is the biggest draw on national television for 37.5% of the entire regular season when that six-game suspension finally began. So I think the NFL decided, and they didn't announce it, and they never would announce it, but they decided to be more lenient with players who potentially won't be allowed to play due to violation of the personal conduct policy or the substance abuse policy. 
because that's where we first noticed this shift. It was with Josh Gordon, Martavis Bryant, and Randy Gregory last year. As those three guys were reinstated after suspensions of at least a year, and there were reports and there were accounts of additional issues and problems and positive tests, and under the league's procedures, they should have been abruptly thrown out of the game for another minimum of one year, but they weren't. See, I I feel like the NFL, and I firmly believe the NFL has decided that it's in the interests of the business to have the best possible players play football, that that's what results in the ratings going up and ultimately recovering from that slump in 2016 and 2017. So that's where they are now, and that's the background, and that's why I believe the NFL, which easily could have suspended Tyree Kill for four games, eight games, 12 games, whatever, the NFL has realized that the potential impact on TV ratings and thus on the business of not having Hill available to play is greater than the potential impact on the business of letting Hill play and dealing with whatever the fallout may be. And really, what will the fallout be? Will there be protests? Will there be demonstrations? Will there be a call for a boycott of the NFL because the NFL didn't suspend Tyree Kill? They've tried to thread this needle in a way that enhances the business. And, you know, it, it's it's the league version of what we always say as it relates to individual teams. With individual teams, they find a way to make an excuse for a great player so the great player can continue to play. The NFL used to be immune from that. Now I think we see the league recognizing we need to have great players on the field. That if we don't have great players on the field, and if we're coming up with reasons to keep great players off the field, we are hurting our business. Bottom line, that's why Tyree Kill wasn't suspended. And I believe that if this had happened two years ago, he would have been suspended just like Ezekiel Elliott was. And if you flip it, if Hill did what he did two years ago and Elliott did what he did this year, Elliott wouldn't have been suspended. He would have been the beneficiary of this realization that it's in the NFL's best interests to keep great players on the field and not concoct reasons to arbitrarily throw them out of the sport, whether it's one game, whether it's one year, whether it's one series. They want the best players on the field, and that's why Tyree Kill wasn't suspended. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.